All right, so let's get started. Hello and welcome everyone to our Codex uh, Speaker Series event. Uh, we have an exciting event ahead of us. Uh, Justice uh, Tino Cuellar is, um, is our speaker today. He's a uh, associate uh, justice of the Supreme Court of California. He's been on, this, on the bench uh, since 2015. And before that, he was a law professor uh, at Stanford Law School and also director of the Freeman Spoli Institute for International Studies um, at Stanford University. And he's here with us to talk about the many dilemmas that are inherent in uh, the question of making artificial intelligence ethical. So, um, so with that uh, brief introduction, I will uh, turn it over to Justice Cuella. Uh, Tino, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, over to you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Roland. It's really a pleasure to be joining you today. I want to talk about the difficult, recurring, interesting questions that are familiar to many of you involving how we align the performance of artificially intelligent systems with human values. But let me first start with a more basic question and a little background. As Roland said, I am a justice of the Supreme Court of California. It's something I never expected to be doing. I feel incredibly honored to do that. I also feel lucky to still have a foot in academia where I teach and do research. And for many years now, I've been interested in how it is that our legal system, particularly public law, regulatory systems, administrative adjudication, government decision-making is affected by new technologies and by the dilemmas and challenges that new technologies bring. Dilemmas around security, dilemmas around governance and democracy, dilemmas around economic inequality, around the possibility of improving how we operate our institutions. But probably like many of you, I got interested in some of the subjects we're gonna talk about today, even before I was a lawyer. And so I wanna just um, ask you a question a little bit, which is, do you remember where you were when you decided that you were interested in artificial intelligence? Assuming you are interested in the subject, I think you are if you're here right now. And if so, like, what does that episode tell you? What does that uh, reveal about your own insight, your own level of interest and engagement in the subject, like what you want to do in the world? For me, I remember it pretty clearly, actually, uh, and just as Roland was inviting me to do this event, I decided to start reflecting on that a bit, trying to reconstruct that moment. I was an undergraduate. At the time I was studying psychology, I was in the process of getting more and more interested in the intersection of psychology, economics, political science. And I was in the psych departments in the, one of the upper floors of this really strange looking white skyscraper that was where the psych department was, along with the sociology department. And uh, I was taking a seminar from a very intense graduate student who was, I think, of Israeli origin. And uh, he asked us to meet him at a lab in this building. So we went into the lab and there was a table. And on top of the table was uh, lying on a little stand, a uh, human brain that had been subject to formal infixation. So it had been sort of preserved. It was the consistency of a kind of hard jelly or sponge. And this graduate student donned these gloves, picked up the brain. And I remember the distinctive antiseptic weird hospital smell. And he, he, he looks at all of us and he says, there were maybe 15 of us in the class. And he says, here in this thing right here are the secrets of life. Everything you think you know and feel is somewhere in tissue just like this. His sense of wonder was palpable and just like really weird. Decades later, as a judge, I think about that moment when I'm hearing oral argument. For a second, I imagine all of us in the courtroom just stripped down to just our brains. And I wonder how it is with that mix of lipid and protein that we create words as lawyers, we write decisions. The thoughts I'm expressing to you right now come from neurons firing off. And I wondered back then, as I wonder now, what if we could harness the secrets of intelligence just like we've harnessed to some extent the secrets of fire? What if we controlled intelligence just as we're able to control fire? Whose lives could we make better? But also what kinds of blazing infernos might we create? And obviously here in California, that question has special uh, relevance given how much we've had to live through wildfires. Back in college, I found it really hard to imagine that intelligence itself was so dependent 
on a substrate, on a particular combination of materials that evolution biology had created that only tissue made of neurons could ever prove capable of intelligence. And I still do. I still wonder whether that's really the right limitation to have. But I've also been affected by the lawyer's conviction that virtually any concept can be scrutinized and sliced and diced like a former living brain that you slice apart uh, when it's preserved in the formalin process to study cortical columns. And of course, a key part to any discussion about AI today has to be that intelligence is a modular concept, that it doesn't just mean one thing. So um, what we have today been able to create with enormous amounts of data and computing power and neural networks and machine learning techniques, what we've been able to create to harness vision, to sometimes generate somewhat coherent language, is a taste of intelligence. Even that taste, though, is enough to prompt the question we're discussing today. How to align the work of algorithms at the heart of modern AI technology with what we could call human values. And my goal in the rest of this opening chat with you is to offer a few brief observations about this problem and then to invite your questions and comments. And as I do so, I'm gonna be drawing on the work that I've done with Rob McCoon, a psychologist on the faculty here at Stanford, Aziz Huck, a fellow law professor, but at the University of Chicago, Dorsa Sadich in the computer science and e, um, electrical engineering department here, and others. And, uh, and I'm gonna basically just acknowledge a few things that are almost so commonplace that they barely need to be said, but I think it's just important to acknowledge them. And that is that, you know, for me, having had this interest since college, one of the ways I got drawn back into the field as a lawyer and now as a judge is seeing how much AI use is growing, not just in the world of online commerce, where uh, surely part of what explains the enormous market capitalization of certain big technology companies is a devastatingly effective way uh, that uh, through which AI inspired technology, AI systems can shape uh, advertising effectively, social media and so on. But even beyond that context in education and healthcare, business strategy and operations, hiring increasingly, national security, finance, technologies that can easily be labeled artificial intelligence and plausibly be labeled artificial intelligence show up. And you know, even if the pace of innovation or the implementation of reforms associated with AI slows down, there's no reason to think that this growing use of AI is gonna stop by itself, or that if we wanted to stop it, if Roland said Codex is big priority from now on is to stop the use of artificial intelligence in government or business decision-making, that there'd be any straightforward or plausible way to stop it. That's not clear. Now, before I, want to, I go on, I wanna note that when we talk about AI, it's easy to blur a distinction that I consider pretty important. And that is the distinction between AI techniques like supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, mixed methods of different kinds, evolutionary survival techniques and so on, and AI systems. And I think it's the systems that are much more relevant and important to any discussion of policy and practicality than the techniques. The techniques are interesting, but we've had some version of them around forever. Uh, not forever, but for many, many decades. Certainly you could go back to the 1970s and find people writing about the equivalent of neural networks. Even convolutional neural networks are not entirely new. What is new is our ability to take those AI techniques to run staggeringly massive amounts of data through them to do all of this using enormous amounts of computing power and then to deliver as a product of all of that, something that is usable to a non-expert. We do that through systems that are integrated mechanisms. In uh, the work that Aziz Huck and I have done, we call these, and I quote, and I apologize because it's kind of a mouthful, but just bear with me. AI systems are socio-technical embodiments of public policy, codified as an appropriate computational learning tool and embedded in a specific institutional context. Translation, it's kind of a mix of function-specific software, systems, architecture, and data that together allow a non-expert to benefit from activity that if it were performed by human, you'd think it would require intelligence. So think about a judge sitting before a screen and a program that is churning through all kinds of data is providing a recommendation 
about how to sentence a particular individual, or even more specifically and clearly, a recommendation about whether to um, deny pretrial release to somebody because that individual uh, poses a risk that is too great to bear by releasing the individual. That is an AI system. An AI system is the technology that allows a company to figure out how in split second time increments, you target advertising to a particular person. It's the mechanism that allows you to look at somebody's nonverbal communication on the screen, and then to derive from that to a non-technical expert a recommendation about whether that person is gonna be a good fit in your company or not. So in the world that we are now living in, where AI systems like what I've just described are proliferating in importance, there are all kinds of interesting questions we could talk about that would be probably capable of sparking a big discussion. I think there's a big discussion to be had around AI, energy consumption and climate. Some of the fanciest AI system applications we have are ones that generate some value, but take up enormous amounts of energy. And if we also think about AI technology, not just as a consumer of energy, but as a tool to limit wasteful energy use, perhaps even to limit the use of fossil fuels, or also to understand better what the consequences are of climate change in the world. There are all kinds of applications we can think of to screen satellite photography, to get a better sense of how patterns of uh, agriculture, access to water will change over time. So that whole question of how much AI consumes energy, but could also be helpful to deal with climate change, one of the world's preeminent challenges is one discussion we could have, but we're not gonna have today. We could have a discussion of a subject that I'm getting very interested in and working with uh, some faculty across the campus on involving adaptive agents. What if we can create software programs that increasingly are effective at representing people in negotiations, in pursuing agendas that people have? And what if these agents are scalable to the point that we can create not only hundreds of thousands, but millions and even billions of them? What does the world look like when they're interacting with each other? How does that affect the legal system, education, healthcare, and so on? We could talk about the very interesting intellectual problem of how you ground language and vision in concrete concepts and symbolic representation. So GPT-3 does all kinds of wondrous seeming things with language, but is that language grounded in something? When GPT-3 says, I'd like to go to Stanford Law School, is there any real understanding in GPT-3 about what Stanford Law School is, where it's located and so on? All those questions are interesting. We might even touch on them. But joining those questions is another one that is the subject of the focus of what I want to share with you in the rest of my talk. And that's just like, what does it mean to take AI systems and increase the possibility that they will behave in an ethical way? That might include that they'll comply with law, but at a minimum, it means that they will behave in a way that the creator could say, this system, you know, uh, at least if it's used the way it was designed to be used, did not do something that if a human had done it would be considered heartless, sociopathic, bad, harmful, etc. Now, there are at least two versions of what it means for an AI system to behave in an ethical manner. One would be act like a sensible human population. Can a system that is designed to steer an autonomous vehicle, for example, or to decide what it is that a drone, an autonomous drone, takes a picture of, can that system behave in a way that is roughly approximate to how a member of a sensible human population would act? Already, you can see that embedded in that description, there are a number of assumptions and question marks. What is a sensible human population? What does an average human mean? If you're trying to scale across that population, how do you deal with different differences in values and so on? An even sort of milder and humbler version of this is just, can you design an AI system that is not going to do anything we consider crazy? So not necessarily act sensibly, but just don't act crazy. And in between act sensibly and don't act crazy, there's some gap, some continuum. And the meta goal ultimately under either one of these notions is to reduce human value, at least in some descriptions of what it means to solve the AI alignment problem that you will find in the academic literature or in organizations that are pursuing the notion of creating safe AI, is the notion of trying to uh, reduce human values to some kind of overarching logic that can be represented symbolically, or maybe uh, to find 
a tiny subset of the human population that have what we might describe as the right values, to find a function perhaps that explains ethical behavior and to code that, to instantiate that into an AI system. Obviously, as AI systems go from being more domain specific, so just about, you know, how do I interpret ambiguous data about weather to should I hire somebody or even more so how should I run an organization? The challenge of creating some capacity to behave reliably, ethically increases. I am not um, unmindful of why that ambition, that goal of ethical behavior across situations in an AI system that increasingly is being designed to operate in very general situations is like a worthy goal. But I want to just make a plea for humility. My, um, my big idea for you, and it's not really a big idea, it's just sort of maybe a restatement of what many of you already believe, but trying to maybe elevate why I think this way of thinking is correct. My big idea is that alignment and explainability are really difficult concepts, but they're very familiar problems. We encounter them with children, with private organizations, with government agencies. We want to create complex entities like an agency or like a private organization, a company that will behave ethically. When we educate a kid, we don't have a very clear picture of everything driving that child's behavior. We aren't certain that that child is going to follow the instructions that we're giving it at age five, at age seven, at age 17, uh, for sure. And yet we do our best to solve these alignment problems, to deal with related issues around explainability, by cross-examining the child, by trying to get different streams of data about the organization. And I don't think we're likely to address these alignment and explainability and you know, AI ethics problems through some overarching technical solution that somehow instantiates the right human values. Um, instead, I suspect that the solutions here are gonna have to be very much like the solutions that we've used for much of the history of at least the modern state and then going back further perhaps, and that is by relying on institutions, we create less and less space for ambiguity and more and more space for debate and deliberation. None of these institutions work especially well. If you think about the US Congress, certainly not. If you think about any court system in America or the world, imperfect by design, by nature. If you think even of highly competent organizations like Stanford University, blessed as it is with lots of people who are very smart and thoughtful and want the institution to perform effectively, nothing is perfect about this institution. Uh, and yet, I think it's important by process of elimination to understand that when we want systems that we rely on to behave ethically, we need to design a whole bunch of different levers that are going to force us to deliberate, talk through what is ethical, monitor behavior, screen data, benchmark, and do the hard work of constantly trying our best to improve the situation we're in rather than expecting that some technical solution is just going to nail the problem. The more totalizing view, the notion that there's some way of gradually narrowing down who it is that has the right ethics, and maybe it's Roland Vogel, and then sort of programming a machine to behave like Roland Vogel is, um, number one, we've actually never achieved that. We've never found a way to appoint one philosopher king and to have that particular person behave accountably and effectively to everybody's benefit. Number two, on a related note, it's awfully risky in present day terms to put all our eggs in one right values basket. We have differing conceptions of what's right and wrong. People disagree, they go to war over that, they fight over that. Number three, evolution and change is an important element of the human condition. And although you can certainly program an ethical AI system to continue to evolve, it's hard to imagine how that evolution process plays out ideally if it doesn't take account somewhat of a fuller range of the influences and dynamics that affect humans when they evolve themselves. So I want to avoid the risks of, um, that arise from delegation to AI systems while preserving some of the benefits. I want to try to work on doing that by instantiating multiple value systems that can argue with themselves, both within an AI system and outside, and make um, legitimacy um, more present focused, meaning something that has to be continually earned 
by showing that a system is behaving in a way that can be defensible, rather than by suggesting that experts got it right five years ago or five months ago or 10 years ago, and now the system is sort of designed to behave ethically and we're largely done. From this follows a couple things, you know, um, as with tort laws focus on a zone of reasonableness or administrative laws focus on behavior that is not arbitrary and capricious. I think the more humble goal around AI ethics should be to establish an AI system that can be entrusted to be within a bound of reasonableness and not to create an AI system that has effectively encoded the precise right human values and can solve the dilemmas that we currently use politics and deliberation and debate for. What this means in practice, to my mind, means focusing on uh, things like what I call relational, non-arbitrariness. You know, do you can you create a system that is designed to let reasonable lay people coherently debate the decision in a way that's meaningful to the process without slowing down the decision to the point that it's paralyzing or overly encumbers the decision-making process? This also means identifying multiple uh, sets of values. Uh, that are presented as worthy of consideration to a user, including values about how situationally specific a response should be. In other words, how much does the right ethical set of values depend on the situation, whether you're driving a car or deciding on the ethics of a biological research lab, and how much does it have to be sort of more generalizing, cutting across those different situations versus very specific? How do we build a body of uh, rich, behaviorally grounded ideas of human values relative to different situations? How do we monitor human behavior to get a rich picture of our values without having that behavior be so affected by AI systems that you get this sort of torque-like feedback effect and can't really observe how it is that people make ethical decisions somewhat more free of the influences that these AI systems are going to increasingly integrate into their lives? And ultimately, how do we retain capacity for oversight and intervention in what these systems do in a way that garners broad legitimacy from the relevant public? Can that be done by designing systems that still help us solve problems involving access to justice or transportation or equity and access to healthcare? Absolutely. Can it be done in a way that displaces and avoids the problems that we continually have about how we adapt to climate change or how we solve income inequality, how we deal with policing problems, I doubt it. I honestly don't think so. I'm happy to have that debate and discussion and you know, more power to the people who want to try, although I would proceed with caution in evaluating that behavior because my own sense is that we ultimately are forced to grapple with politics and with trade-offs and with disagreements about interpretation as a fundamental part of living in a complex society with lots of differing voices and values. The secrets of intelligence ultimately aren't only found in the brain, they're found in the complicated and imperfect institutions we've used our brains to build. And we're gonna to need to use those institutions if we have any hope of making AI systems behave in ways that make us better off rather than worse off. And with that, I look forward to your questions and comments. Great, Tino. Thank you so much. What a what an exciting uh, uh, thought journey you're taking us on. And uh, we so folks, if you have uh, questions, please uh, put them in the chat. Um, and uh, and maybe I'll start off. So <clears throat> first of all, I think yes, it's a very good idea not to create a system that is based on my personal ethics as my, my as Roland Vogel's Sorry, I had to ethics. pick up someone, Roland. <laughs> no, it's, no, just uh, for the sake of, uh, of uh, everyone's uh, sanity, I think that would be not, not a good idea, but uh, uh, I, it's an interesting question. I think um, you touched on so many important themes, including you know, the, the role of, um, of uh, uh, tra uh, transparency uh, and, and, and how we create those systems uh, that will allow us to understand, you know, what, uh, what the ethics are that the particular system might, might wanna, wanna, fo might wanna follow. And, and you're very true, as I, also as a scholar of international law, which you, are, uh, which you also are, um you know it's very different from geography you know the situation to situation legal system to legal system is very different what the what the rules might want to be and then it it's an interesting question as to how are we trying to extract the specific ethics uh in a particular situation if we use uh 
you know, machines, uh, you know, machine learning technology, then it will give us a picture of how a certain situation, uh, a certain law, say, uh, operates in a particular situation, which may not at all be really what the intention is of the of the lawmakers initially, or what the what the overarching roles are. Because many times there's a disconnect between those two, which then brings in the other question again that you also raised, which is you know, if we create a, a normative system for for uh, for a particular, you know, a rule system to, for a particular AI system to follow, you know, what what are the what are the generally accepted rules that it should follow? And if it fails in some way, you know, what's the, how can we hold an AI system accountable? You know, should there be you 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 talk about this reasonable the reasonable person standard uh, like from the tort system and you know, some people have been, you know, another question is connection is, is there, you know, is there sort of like a, a, a protect, you know, like, like for the corporation, you know, should AI systems be given their own uh, personhood, you know, and they could be in the worst case, you could, as a judge, you could say like, okay, this, this AI system needs to be terminated, right? And it's sort of separated from its creators, right? Because they also take their own sometimes AI systems start making their own decisions that were not that are sort of disconnected from what you know uh, the, their creators uh, originally wanted so anyway so uh so those are all this is you're taking us to, to a really interesting journey here so well, so one of the first questions that came in is from uh from Injun uh, and I think you answered her question uh, her or his question uh, which is, you know, from where the academic de legal scholar debate was on technologies previously, how has it changed to the AI? Con how has it changed in the AI context? So, where where does AI fit in the in the legal debate among lawyers and scholars? And you raised a lot of different different aspects, which I think are the hot topics that we think when we're thinking of law of AI and law and policy of AI issues, but are there some topics that stand out to you in particular as being of particular interest? Yeah, thank you, great question. So it's useful maybe to compare three different kinds of technological change, maybe, maybe four uh, to kind of situate AI. So um, one of the weird things about technology for any of us interested in the subject is, what is one generation's technology becomes another generation's just like feature of like daily life. And it's not considered like high technology. That's kind of a commonplace point, but just understand for a moment how cool that is. That means if we were to get into a time machine and go back to the 1930s, airplanes and cars would still be considered sort of high tech at some level. They were well on their way to becoming not that, just becoming so ordinary. But, but it's useful to note that one generation of technology law was sort of how to manage the infrastructure, the massive infrastructure of transportation and electricity, the rise of which defined the 20th century and brought along with it connectivity, new forms of corporate organization in some cases, particularly, well, if you go back to include railroads, certainly that's the case. Um, safety issues as people's expectations of safety from traveling in cars went from, oh, let's just be safer than however safe you are in a horse and boogie to let's just have fewer and fewer people die, like as a percentage of the population, if you can do something super simple to prevent safety problems. And so then tort law and highway safety law regulation kind of kicks in. But more recently, it is interesting to me to compare the legal questions around cyber law round one. So the rise of the internet provoked these profound, like soul-searching, incredibly contentious questions about who owns information, who has a right to stop information from flowing, how broad or narrow are these protections from uh, the appropriation of ideas, so patent and copyright. And a number of people associated, in fact, with this law school, including Larry Lessig, were, were just really influential in describing how it is that these constraints on the spread of ideas were borders. They were effectively just as powerful as the borders that you create on a map to some degree, and just as capable of creating their own sub-communities, their own political economies, their own warring factions, as it were. 
What I think is different about artificial intelligence is encased a little in this notion of what a system is, the way I've described it, which is to say, it's not that we, it's not just that we can use certain analytical techniques to more quickly discern whether there's a pattern somewhere. It's that these techniques can be encased, wrapped up in a special set of software capabilities that now makes this stuff really easily accessible to somebody who is not tweaking and tinkering with the system and is also not an expert in any way. So think about the way uh, one of our top quantitatively oriented faculty members might crunch through the data to create a display of data that gives you a sense of how given a whole bunch of quantitative information, you can find in what restaurants you're more likely to create a pattern of, or to see a pattern of over-enforcement of code violations of violations of food safety codes. And the difference between that capacity that that faculty member has working with that software and that data to a system that tells you what do you want to learn about, can read your emotion and your tone of voice, can tell you uh, where to find information about that restaurant, but can also maybe make a guess about why it is you wanted to ask that question to begin with. We're not exactly there yet, but I have to believe that it would be really crazy to think that we're not gonna get there pretty soon and that this technology is not gonna be available across the board to hundreds of millions and then eventually to billions of people. I do think that's different. It's a little bit like the difference between the world we were in in the 1500s where there were corporate partnerships and organizations, but they weren't commonplace, they weren't really big. And the world we're in right now where organizations, corporations, agencies have proliferated. And as Charlie Strauss points out, the original artificial intelligence is probably the corporation. It's a means of gathering data, operating in ways beyond what a single human could do, harnessing new forms of intelligence, right? Just as that technology has scaled and become part of our social life, it's hard to imagine a future, at least on the trajectory we're on, assuming we deal with climate change and we don't blow ourselves up, where this kind of AI system technology that can communicate with us so easily and ingratiate itself into our lives doesn't become ubiquitous. So uh, Morris has an has a interesting um, question too. He's um, saying, uh, uh, you know, what, in your opinion, Aside from political feasibility, you know, what uh, would work best uh, in US AI regulation? Uh, a, horizontal, a horizontal vertical legal ethical framework on a federal and state level, uh, two, standardization, certification, and validation, or three, dynamic ex ante cross disciplinary self regulatory technology impact assessments, depending on sectors and risks, or perhaps a combination of the three. Do we have any, any thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I admire the taxonomic stamina. That could, is better than any AI system could do, at least at this point. I have, you know, I would say probably understand 70 or 80% of what I think each concept and each label is, but they're great labels. And um, I, uh, I will make a note of them. Uh, look, I think at some level it's complicated, but at some level it's pretty simple. I start with the premise that we have a number of agencies already that have a fairly robust domain of regulatory authority that's really quite relevant here. The FDA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, the FAA when it comes to things like drones and aviation, the Federal Trade Commission when it comes to things like consumer protection. You know, the FCC has some role to play. Uh, there's a, you know, probably some role for a few other agencies. There's an OSHA role on worker safety. But in particular, I would say the Federal Trade Commission, the FDA with respect to medical devices and the role of AI in medicine, and, um, and, and the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration are good examples of how some AI regulatory problems are best dealt with domain by domain by domain. In some respects, even as we move towards more generalized systems with more generalized functions, it's still appropriate, I think, for an agency to say, look, design an AI system to do any kind of like, you know, all kinds of things. Like you can design an AI system that would make a really great social friend, will ingratiate itself, will make you happy, will tell you a joke when you want to hear it, will pick you up when you're feeling sad. But if you're asking that AI system to give you medical advice, 
then you know we have some things to say at the FDA about exactly what should happen. It shouldn't tell you that if you take you know hydroxychloroquine that somehow you're not going to get you know COVID nineteen. It, it you know and here's the way we're going to deal with that. And on top of those specific regulatory domains that I mentioned that agencies already have jurisdiction for, I would preserve a robust role for the states because Robert Dahl was not wrong. I think it was Robert Dahl when he said that we can rely on and benefit from laboratories of democracy. If ever I've seen a place where that actually has some logic to it, it's in this domain. And you are going to hear calls for standardization of the law because of high transaction costs of having Minnesota and California have somewhat different approaches. I haven't seen any uh, reliable, plausible, analytical, or empirical demonstration that that really um, is a good argument for preempting the states. So some room for states to do a little bit of regulating through administrative regulation, but in particular to use the tort system to help us figure out the right balance, I think is really key. There are other things to say about this. There are some international law pieces around autonomous weapons, maybe maybe a few places where some ethical principles particularly might govern research and research especially that might have particular downstream consequences that might be especially risky. But I would start by emphasizing that the existing legal system we have has not been shown to be ineffective or irrelevant to a lot of the questions we're facing right now. Mm. So I want to get to, uh, to a related question. I know that the more uh, more this question comes from um, a European vantage point, I think. And uh, Mark Rotenberg, who is uh, one of the leading privacy experts and knows a lot also about the um, the, the legal cultural differences between the EU and the US has actually asked a question here. And uh, he says, you know, there is at the moment a highly charged political debate about AI and political institutions. In uh, particular, is there a democratic approach to AI as opposed to an authoritarian approach to AI? This issue plays out now in the growing tension between the US and China, with President Biden stating explicitly that our technology should reflect our values and the EU moving to adopt an extensive regulation for AI. And uh, where I believe they even mentioned certain uses, like you know the social score, um, I think that 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 um, that they're opposed. I actually, uh, Mark mentions it here too. So, <laughs> so you moving to adopt ex extensive regulation for AI? How do you view this? How do you view this debate? Should democratic nations draw red lines for certain AI applications, such as the social scoring in China, or the use of AI for uh, face surveillance? Good question, and uh, hi, Mark. Um, good. Um, I, I guess I would start by noting that Aziz Huck and I have written a short piece on what we think of as a sort of democratic approach to regulating AI. So I won't uh, belabor the whole thing, except to say that the premise of your question is one that we endorse. We do think that there is such a thing as a more democratic approach to regulating AI. And there are at least three important components to that approach. One would be a recognition that AI technology, AI systems are becoming so ubiquitous that they are influencing the democratic process. And societies in Europe and the US and other countries that have a tradition of freedom of speech and limits on regulation of political speech and participation then face some real dilemmas, which are very plainly demonstrated right now in the context of the difficulty of striking the right balance with respect to what we expect from big social media platforms where we, we don't want to necessarily restrict the freedom of people to post things or to express themselves, but we also want to avoid the worst consequences of having blatantly false information spread really easily. So we, we think that dilemma is really important and probably needs to be solved in a smart, thoughtful way that doesn't mean you know, zero engagement or change from the platforms, but also means proceeding with caution. Second, we uh, believe that in a democracy, we should expect the public authorities to have the degree of independence and capacity to regulate certain features of the use of AI systems, as for example, affecting medical care. And that if there's too much agency or capture by industry, um, too much concentration of wealth and power in that respect, 
Could it conceivably interfere with the democratic process? Of course it could. In AI is another context, but certainly in AI, there are arguments that the uh, concentration of data and power is uh, especially worth scrutinizing. And number three, we think it's sort of important to develop a culture. And I use the word culture on purpose because I don't mean to suggest that this is something that can be solved by regulation, but a culture of uh, understanding that AI systems are a technology to shape attitudes, behaviors, and values, not just a technology for selling things or for making decisions about policing, but for shaping your views about the world. And the more people understand that, the more they're aware of that, just like we might expect people to be aware that if you mix a particular combination of sugar, salt, and fat, and present it to people in a crunchy snack, it's incredibly difficult for any number of people to resist, even if they care a lot about nutrition. Being aware of that is very helpful. Now, let me just note two other quick things in closing to this question. One thing to note is an authoritarian approach to AI can mean many different things. We can have that conversation, but certainly uh, it's quite possible that one of the benefits of um, AI systems to authoritarian regimes is a sort of early warning intelligence gathering aspect to uh, public opinion and behavior. So that rather than having to have elections or more formal mechanisms of representation, you can pick up on where it is that the discontent is and try to swoop in and do something, maybe even the minimal thing you need to do to preserve the regime from continuing. And that ought to be a source of concern, I think. But I should note that dem democracies also need to work hard on thinking about how AI systems can benefit people. And here, I just want to emphasize in closing that AI systems are not necessarily an unalloyed bad at all. It's important to recognize we have incredible inequities around education, around access to justice, around access to healthcare. And if there were a way of democratizing access to expertise so that more people had access to the equivalent of a terrific teacher, or some responsive uh, uh, fount of medical expertise, that has a lot to recommend itself. So I feel like the imperative on people who care about the connection between AI and democracy is not just to limit, but also to promote innovation and appropriate use. Mm. So uh, there's a, a lot of great questions coming in. And so I'm gonna go through them a little bit in a, you know, sort of a, in a random order, but, uh, but here that, that are two that are kind of a little bit more um, related to each other. So the first one is, um, that, well, thank you, Justice uh, Queer, so much for the amazing insights. Uh, question I'm curious about is that at a high level, how do you think AI platforms will be able to assist in legal situations such as toxic tort cases where even human experts or judges are not able to decide the weight of different evidence decisively? Uh, yeah, maybe we'll start with that. That's yeah, great that. question. So uh, I, I actually view that problem as pretty analogous in some ways to how AI systems will probably play a growing role. They're already playing a role, but it will play a growing role in the genesis of regulatory rulemaking proposals, where th this is something in, in one paper I'm calling artificially intelligent regulation, and it has its risks, but it also has its potential benefits. So think about the work that scientists have to do inside an agency right now to determine how to use the regulatory authority of the EPA, for example, to regulate pesticides. A pesticide, of course, can be effective only if it kills some things, but if it kills too much and if it uh, creates toxic effects on uh, humans and other species beyond what we consider safe, it's a problem. The ability of expert scientists, biochemists, to discuss and discern where to draw that line is limited to some extent by their own constraints of intelligence. They can use a bunch of statistical tools, they can use theory, but I can definitely imagine AI systems that are able to pick up on the similarity, for example, between the molecule that is at the core of a pesticide that seems safe based on traditional tools, but in fact shares some, some suspicious, potentially problematic similarities to a pesticide that was found subsequently to actually be more harmful than it was initially believed to be. And can I imagine in the context of toxic tort litigation, 
that there would be debates involving experts who use machine learning models, certainly unsupervised learning models. What I've described is sort of akin to unsupervised or supervised learning, some version of it. But I could also imagine some forms of reinforcement learning coming to this, absolutely. But I also want to note that to me, like the access to justice possibilities of AI technology are especially pronounced, not necessarily in the toxic tort context, but in the domain of situations where we have to deliver somehow mass justice to people. And the stakes seem not so high to somebody sitting comfortably in uh, the lounge of a startup in Palo Alto uh, and, or maybe a large company, but for somebody litigating whether they're owed a $7,000 or a $5,000 bill from services rendered or trying to stay in their home because of some litigation dispute or some rent issue or some maintenance problem. Most of that stuff happens pro se with, with no access to uh, legal advice. And if it went into the spectrum, we have like an awesome lawyer who's gone to a terrific uh, law school, had great professors and is like just so great. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have a lay person who has very little knowledge of the legal system, very little time, and a lot of stress. Somewhere in between are a bunch of possibilities that are hard to ignore to improve that mass adjudication process. So, so I think you already answered another question that Lance um, asked, which is, do you envision AI systems demonstrably entering into the realm of legal reasoning, such as augmenting or replacing lawyers, and also any thoughts about so-called robot judges? So I think, you know, your answer was a little bit kind of... Uh, going in that direction already that we will be able to have systems that will help us adjudicate cases but sorry I just don't want to yeah no that's great I'll just say a little bit more about that it's we could spend an hour talking about this or more because at a high level of generality it's sort of not so difficult to say hey inappropriate situations where mass justice is involved where the difficulty in adjudicating is not so great. And the real problem is people don't know how to navigate an opaque legal system. They have little time, they have little money, but a lot is at stake for them. Mm -hmm. Could we do better with AI systems to advise on how to litigate the case or even to litigate the case itself? And perhaps even a judge assisted by AI systems to speed up the decision-making process and to avoid situations where people have to wait months or even years mm -hmm. for decision. Yes, check to all of that. However, at least two questions arise that are difficult. One is, how do we assess that system to know that it's working with integrity over time, particularly as it evolves in response to the sort of like reinforcement learning process that the different AI systems are using to optimize their language and ever more be sort of strategic? And then second, where do we draw the line in how we define what's appropriate and what's not appropriate? And here I'm gonna rely on a, point that I made earlier about legitimacy, right? Let's remember that the legal system is only partially about smartly solving a dispute. And it's very heavily about making people feel like they got their day in courts. They were able to plead their case to a bunch of people who are accountable. And we have different ways of making people accountable. We use peer pressure. We use retention elections. We use, you know, the Commission on Judicial Performance. But that accountability is designed to make a human adjudicator feel like if she messes up over and over again, if she gets it wrong over and over again, her colleagues are not going to think her work is great. Or, uh, you know, maybe these folks will be looked at negatively by their peers who are going to think that they're just taking shortcuts in their reasoning or being too harsh or ignoring their uh, role. And what we have yet to design are AI systems that can credibly claim to be part of that uh, community of people who are feeling the sting of having failed at being accountable. You with me? Like to put it slightly differently, if I write an opinion and there's a petition for rehearing and the petition for rehearing points out that there's a glaring mistake, like a really bad mistake, like there was a Supreme Court case from 20 years ago that I ignored, I wouldn't feel great about that. Just pause on that for a moment. I wouldn't feel great about that. There's a lot in human institutions, like somebody asked in the chat, like what institutions do you mean? I mostly mean institutions that leverage that capacity of humans to feel good and to feel bad about things as a way that we identify with 
And certainly you can put that in the context of a trial court judge too, right? So I think my own enthusiasm for the potential of having this technology improve mass adjudication is tempered by the need to keep it legitimate and therefore the need to link some of the decision-making to a human who can be accountable and can be viewed as having failed if something goes wrong for the foreseeable okay. future. So that, so staying with your uh, role as a judge, um, Juliana's question seems uh, seems uh, appropriate here. Um, so she's saying, "I would like to know your opinion about the use of AI as a mean of um, as a means for collecting digital evidence in penal procedures, considering the uh, potential access to many personal and private data." Um, how could you deal with that? Yeah, I think it's really tough, right? Like if you would have gotten me in two thousand and two when I had been a law professor for one year post 9-11, I would have said something like, it's an important step on the road to something quasi-authoritarian to basically equip our infrastructure, our walls, our cars, our roads, our parks, with the ability to constantly gather data, whether it be visual data or auditory data or behavioral data, to build an electronic infrastructure that we're all going to be using for commerce, for entertainment, for communication that will be constantly gathering data about us and more and more and more pinpointing who is the lawbreaker or the suspected lawbreaker. And I would have said, these algorithms don't work as well as, pe as well as people think. So there'll be lots of false positives and maybe even some false negatives. I would have said, even if they work pretty well, the risk that they'll be misused is too high. And I would have said, the combined effect of all this working together is gonna to have a lot of unintended consequences. Okay, 20 years later, I think that's still partially true, but I have spent a lot of my career over the last few decades, I wanna say now, or decade and a half, struggling with the problem of discretion. How discretion is both good and bad. Discretion is the power of Roland's, I'm gonna keep on picking on you because you're right in front of me. So if Roland runs the San Francisco Police Department, and Roland is asked, you know, we have just enough evidence to seek a search warrant here from this very important official who may or may not be breaking the law, but we also may be looking like we're being too heavy handed on this person because this person has been a critic of the police. What do we do? And legally, the question is ambiguous, like it's not overly clear. The, the, the lawyer who advises the police department says, you know, it's really a judgment call. Like, what do I do with the fact that we have built a bunch of institutions that rely on people like Roland in the best instance to use their good judgment, right? And my answer is that is both part of what saves us because it's part of what makes somebody accountable, but it's also part of what sinks us. It's part of what creates disparities in policing, part of what introduces racial bias, not because you know there's any conscious racial bias, but there's implicit bias and judgments that people make that are not carefully reasoned. And in that milieu, do I think human judgment is always gonna be better than machine judgment? No, I don't. Do I think machine judgment is always better than human judgment? No. So we're kind of stuck, I would say. And so I worry <laughs> greatly that, like the answer I would have given in 2001 is just a little too easy. I think a better answer is we should be very careful and cautious about building in too much automatic surveillance. But do I want machines to be involved in assessing whether there's a pattern of disparate enforcement? by screening the behavior of bureaucracies relative to the information that can be obtained about what potential evidence is out there? Maybe yes. Take it one step further. Can I imagine that there are gonna be some really horrible crimes that can be prevented if people opt into a system that says like, hey, something is amiss in this residence. Something is not right. Somebody just broke in. Let's not wait for somebody to be so freaked out or stabbed that they'll call the police. Let's just activate a response right now. You know. I'm not ready to say that people shouldn't be able to live in a world that partly leverages that kind of innovation. I just feel like we have, just like we are distrustful of ourselves and our own judgment, but we still rely on it. We have to build in that capacity to how we create this relationship with the AI systems. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point too. So many times we say ambiguity is sort of the enemy of, you know, automating or mechanizing a particular area in the law but at the same time it's intentional in many areas in the law but many times it's uh, unintentional ambiguity and it's similar with discretion maybe ai can help us understand the areas better where yeah, we need absolutely. to 
That's well said, Roland. And I, I just want to make this one comment before we're gone, because this is a really tricky issue. It really is. And I can see it both ways. I mean, there are so many places on the spectrum. But here's the challenge. And here's why particularly universities and probably this audience can play a good role in discussing the intricacy of these questions around surveillance and enforcement in AI. So when I worked in Washington, what I loved about the job is pushing an affirmative agenda that I thought was mostly really quite beneficial for the country. I liked the person I worked for in the Obama administration. I thought it was a good administration was trying to do the right thing. It wasn't perfect. But there would be sometimes the questions would come up about particular initiatives that the administration was pursuing. And what I found is that it was very difficult to have, I mean, you know, I always engaged in communication I thought was honest and as thoughtful as I could with the public when I did speak about something in public. But it was still hard to have nuanced conversations. Like if somebody says like, well, you know, how likely is it that the Affordable Care Act will work perfectly? There's always this pressure in the background to say, oh, of course it'll work perfectly. What are you talking about? We designed it. It's a great plan. It's going to solve every health problem, right? And in fact, what is needed sometimes is to say something like, well, actually, it's better than what we have right now. It's an imperfect compromise. It'll work okay, we hope. There are some risks around it. It's still worth supporting. But no, it's not perfect, you know, and there are going to be all kinds of dangers and risks. And I, I sort of yearn for those conversations about the role of AI on, around, you know, both versions of the issue. You know, can we benefit from it? What are the risks? Because that strikes me as the most intellectually honest way of proceeding. Mm. So, uh, okay, so a few more questions from our audience. Dewey is saying, excellent ideas. Thank you. Speed is an issue. AI systems may need quicker processes to get feedback on how to adjudicate a solution. How would you use your insights to inform quicker responses uh, with the potential appeals later on? Terrific. By, by building AI systems that are nitpicky, that are skeptical, that are actually going to help us instantiate the diversity of views and opinions. So on, I count 96 participants still on this uh, session. And we have probably enormous agreement on certain things about, you know, probably that democracy is valuable, even though it has its challenges, that, you know, there are many kinds of government action, official government action that constitute like brutality. But around many issues, we probably have a pretty robust discussion. Certainly of some of the things I've said, some of you disagree and think I'm really being too optimistic or too pessimistic. And you would be right to point out the premise of the question was just asked that to have a full debate about that is going to take us all the time we have and then some. I'm looking for debates that can happen in effect, partly mediated by software, partly within the confines of, the, of even one AI system that reflect strongly differing values that are all defensible. Let me give you an example from law enforcement that might, might get a little bit about what I'm, what I'm uh, getting close to or trying to suggest. So surely one of the most fraught decisions that any police officer makes is to pull out a gun. Once you've pulled out your gun, the possibility that you're actually going to fire it is enormously greater. Like it's very hard to fire a hol uh, holstered gun. How to make that decision? Again, we all benefit from having some police officers who are not only conscientious, but who take their training seriously, who continually try to improve their training, who try to mentor other police, and understand how incredibly fraught uh, a process it is to pull out your gun. Do it cautiously if they've ever done it. Uh, and when they do it, they proceed with as much caution as they can. But there will be times when even the best cops have to make that decision in a split second. And if I could freeze that moment, just freeze it and slow down time. Would I want all of us on this call to be able to have a discussion about that that might advise a cop? Would I want some AI systems to be able to ch uh, churn some data and maybe do some uh, supervised and unsupervised learning uh, on what it is that is similar about the situation to some situations that have gone badly wrong, or what it is that is similar of the situation to some situations where it was the pulling out of a gun that saved some lives. I would want that. Would I also want maybe some reinforcement learning to see how little tweaks in the environment that the cop is um, navigating might lead to drastically different outcomes to make the cop aware of maybe some detail that she hasn't seen at this moment? I would love for all that to happen. 
But a police officer here would tell us that that decision has to happen in a split second. So if we end up living in a world in 20 years or in 20 months, more likely, where some of those decisions are gonna be advised by machine. Danger cop, don't pull out your gun right now. You're in a very risky situation to firing your weapon wrongly. Would I want that machine learning process to be informed by different ML systems with different value systems in real time? Yes, I would. And you can see that where this discussion is going is a lot of the difficulty is gonna come around uh, user interface design, like how you convey ambiguity to a human decision maker that has to make a split second decision to be accountable. And when you protect the human from that decision and allow the machine to make the decision, but let the decision in batches be reviewed by a human, you know, 10 decisions or a hundred or a thousand decisions at a time. I want a science around that, and I want a value system around that, and I want people on this call to be part of that discussion. That's how we solve the problem, because very, very frequently, we will simply not be able to slow down time. Eric is ask, asking um, from your educator cap, I'm curious if you could talk a bit about the uh, capacity of, capacities of regulators and policymakers in organizations like the FDA, the FTC, the FCC to deal with new technical topics like AI and other emerging technologies. What can we be doing to increase those capacities? For example, upskilling current current policymakers, decision makers in these topics, and or bringing more technologists into those agencies. It seems like some agencies, like the FDA, are strongly relying on the expertise of the private sector, uh, which uh, can, which I can imagine, creates its own incentives and uh, democratic challenges. Good question. A very well informed question. The work that David Engstrom and uh, Dan Ho and Kathy Sharkey and I did with the Administrative Conference of the US to look at how federal administrative agencies are using AI systems makes me mildly optimistic, but I'm gonna absolutely acknowledge the premise of the question that was just asked. There's no uh, denying that a whole bunch of agencies are relying heavily on contractors to get the most sophisticated technical expertise that there are probably some blind spots that some agencies have, particularly around the intersection of AI and cybersecurity issues, I would say, that there are uh, difficulties, I think, in keeping up with the speed of innovation in certain uh, quarters of the private sector. That said, I almost feel like it's more dangerous to assume that the capacity of government to work on this is totally broken and closely related that private sector innovation is so fast that there's really no hope of regulating than it is to think like, well, we have some capacity in government, we should build on it, we should supplement it, we should work on improving contracting. But there are actually, I, I was basically what I'm saying is I was impressed by, in particularly a few agencies, FDA, SEC, as Social Security Administration, like a surprising amount of real attention to these questions of how do you use machine learning? A little bit less so like what comes after machine learning in AI? Maybe a little bit less so how do we use AI systems to interact with the public? But around how do we use AI systems to adjudicate, to enforce, and what aspects of AI activity within our agency's jurisdiction should be regulated? There's a kernel of the capacity there. So the question is how to supplement that and protect it and grow it. And it would seem to me that that's in the private sector's interest, because the more thoughtful and, uh, and sophisticated that capacity is, the fewer mistakes the regulators are going to make. And I do think, yes, that does take making sure that some people in this call and others that you can influence continue to think that going into government service is a useful thing, even if you have a big trade-off you make in terms of money. I think it's also useful to understand that it's important to keep access to data for government so that government can make smart decisions that it's important to realize that government is getting contradictory demands, like use data smartly, but don't violate privacy, but don't do this, but don't do that, but don't do that, but do it at the lowest cost, but do it in the most sophisticated way. I don't think that every problem in government, but probably more than two thirds of the problems government has, at least in the US, come from those contradictory demands where we wanna have multiple things at the same time. In uh, a great uh, case involving uh, worker safety and the regulation of benzene, there is a famous concurring opinion that one of the justices of the Supreme Court uh, writes saying, look, sometimes there can be such a thing as adding so many different contradictory demands that the agency ends up with no clue about what it's really supposed to do. 
And I think we have to fight that. We have to try to, as a public and as government, people who are involved in government to prioritize what's most important about protecting the public. But, um, but I think there's hope for government to do better, particularly if people are willing to go and spend time working there. Yeah, and uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's a great that's a that's a great point too, and and uh, and one that you've definitely uh, you know implemented in your in your own life and serving in academia and government different roles and and um, and we're fortunate to to have people like you, to, you know, take take on these challenges. Um, Want to come to uh, Patricia's questions quickly? Uh, many. In many discussions, feedback monitoring update of systems and human agency are totally overlooked. Is this a problem of education, uh, regulation, and oversight? And then maybe relate this as a follow on to her question How do you think we should approach the education of the legal community in these intricacies? Uh, this is consequential on many levels, you know, justice, regulation, policies, policy, but the gap seems too, too wide to bridge. Thank you. Uh, good questions. I'm in kind of inspired to mention a couple of disparate things. Let me maybe say two things. Um, one is that I think we'd all be better off recognizing not only the distinctions between AI systems and humans, but the similarities, which is to say, okay, the distinctions do matter, right? In particular, as I suggested earlier, Humans are capable of feeling shame, guilt, sadness when they fail, appreciation for doing a great job. And we have yet to design AI systems that come anywhere near that capacity. And you know, people can try to rebut me, Let's treat this as a rebuttable presumption, but until someone rebuts it, I'm going to go with it. In the years that I've spent studying organizations and agencies, it's really hard to explain when agencies work well, when organizations perform highly, when it isn't in reference to some of those human capabilities and qualities I just mentioned, which is to say when we learn something and we get it right, when we do right by our customers and our workers and our colleagues, we feel good about it most of the time. We don't just like notch the probability of, an, of, of a promotion and the marginal increase in income, like we feel good about it. When we fail, we don't like that we failed. So, so that is an important distinction. That said, the similarities are also important, which is to say, just as AI systems can suffer from dirty data and overly simplistic algorithms and uh, too much confidence in their predictions and systems that don't hold them accountable or don't review their decisions, all of that is true of us humans as well. We have some qualities to try to mitigate that, which is mostly conversation, deliberation, people challenging our, our decisions, but, uh, but that has to be activated, right? And particularly in the split second decisions, that's really difficult. So we have to think carefully about how to deal with dilemmas like that, how to hold people accountable ex post in the appropriate way without chilling their behavior. This is why tort liability for policing actions is a really big deal and a really hard thing to get right, the balance. But I guess I would also say that on the point about education, I want lawyers to understand how and when the legal system might benefit from AI. But I want them to also understand how much the, le the legal system has to provide, to offer AI and its development. Let me say just a touch more about that, if I may, before we take the next comment. So it's very common for people to say, oh, the legal system moves so slowly. Technology moves so quickly, the legal system will never be able to catch up. It's so common, I bet you you've heard that in some codex talks. And as I've said, there's a little element of truth to that in some respects, some aspects of system design change awfully quickly. But I would just ask for anybody who's still on this call, like ask for more discussion about why people think that's right. Like when people say that, ask them, what do you mean? Do you mean tort law or do you mean like statutory law? Do you mean regulation? Do you mean the FDA or do you mean NHTSA? Because I worry that we don't fully understand that the legal system was designed, however imperfectly, to constantly be dealing with changing situations, recombinant DNA technology, nuclear, you know, drones, the internet, and you know, it's not designed to work perfectly perhaps. It's designed to partly be a reflection of our own human limitations and desires. 
But anyone who simply claims the legal system has nothing to offer here is essentially making a claim that society would be better off with no regulation. And I would just say like, well, tell me why. Like, why do you think that's the case? Uh, notice, for example, that the reasonable person standard built into tort law is rather flexible. It's actually designed to evolve over time. It's not designed to be static. How it is that regulatory rules can be adapted, changed, replaced. They can be awfully silly sometimes and totally brittle, or they can be incredibly thoughtfully created to take account of changes in technology and society. And getting that balance right is crucial, but I think it starts by having lawyers understand that they have something to bring to the discussion. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it's one of the takeaways from the pandemic is also that, you know, regulation and policy matters and has life or death outcomes. Uh, and so I want to, you and know, by the way, a world, a world without regulation can be a scary one for the technology sector. Like, think about the incredible dilemmas around hard judgments around social media platforms and what they have to do. And, you know, wouldn't it be beautiful for them, for some of them at least, if they had a simple rubric of what they should do or not do? Obviously, our own constitutional constraints can make that difficult. So we have to sort of like experiment and play around with concepts and ideas like, you know, an oversight board that's partly independent or something partly legal, partly norms. But it's, it's a clear indication that we need to use the social technology we've created to try to figure out how to solve these problems. And that's called law, however imperfect it is. And if it doesn't work well, then we should change it. So we're pretty much at the end of our time, but and I wasn't able to get to everyone's questions. And I, my apologies for that. Folks had really great questions. But I think I, as, I, as I sort of browse through the questions that you, through your uh, presentation, answered actually most of the questions there's just one final one, which we maybe might make the last question for our uh, talk, which is uh, Fritz's question, who's asking you to uh, address the converse, you know, the uh, the issue that you know the conversation as you prescribe for assessment is defeated when developers say that an algorithm is a trade secret uh, and not to be uh, looked at so closely as. Um, as, and therefore not to be looked at as too closely. And so that's an issue, you know, sort of these um, the kind of closed uh, algorithms that companies, uh, um, you know, claim trade secrets in. Uh, and and I wa wanted to know if you had any thoughts on, on how as policymakers or judges, uh, we, should, uh, we should deal with those, uh, those issues, you know, the lack of transparency around how they are. Thank you, Roland, and I should express my appreciation to you. You've been a terrific moderator. It's hard to keep up with the chat, and I'm really grateful to the audience for such thoughtful questions. You've left me with a lot of ideas. I've been taking notes. I'll show you here. I've been taking notes. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to stay fairly general on this question because I can imagine it coming up in litigation, but let's just say that I am certainly not surprised that if substantial decision-making power practical power, maybe not even de jure power, but just the reality that power is lodged in, a, in an algorithm, in an AI system that is advising a decision maker, the reality that that's occurring is provoking a desire to understand, well, like what is driving that exactly? What is the so-called secret sauce? Why can't I examine it? How am I supposed to defend myself with integrity if something bad is happening to me? Whether it be like my business is being temporarily shut down for alleged worker safety violations or something where the criminal process is happening to me. If I can't scrutinize pretty much every aspect about that system that is having such outsized power. And one way that courts navigate that, but I wonder if it's entirely satisfying, is to say like, well, maybe, uh, maybe the decision maker wasn't even that influenced by this AI system because the decision maker says that she made the decision on her own. But increasingly, I think we're gonna find that that is uh, gonna be challenged because the reality is gonna be people are very swayed by all this. I'm mildly optimistic that we have faced this problem before. If you think about it, anytime an agency is engaging in enforcement, it wants to strike a balance between being something other than completely arbitrary, because arbitrary behavior generally doesn't work well when you're justifying what you did in court. And on the other hand, some degree of opacity so that it's not obvious how you can reverse engineer your own behavior so you can avoid any risk of being caught when you're not complying. Worker safety, taxation, environmental enforcement, FDA enforcement, like 
a lot of these, lots of the criminal process have these dilemmas built in. And we don't have a perfect way of dealing with this. Sometimes we deal with it by investing a lot or putting a lot of weight in discretion. But I do think we have some techniques we can use, including in-camera review. And I, I would imagine that if society is going to get this right, we're going to have to be um, uh, pushing <laughs> so that there is some degree of accountability. And so uh, some desire for secrecy simply asserted is, uh, is not always enough. All right. Well, on that note, uh, Tina, it's been really fascinating to, to follow your uh, thought process and, and, and guiding us through the different issues that, that we encounter when we think about creating ethical AI. And so this has been tremendously interesting and educational uh, for, for me and I feel for, for our uh, audience too. I think the many great questions that we uh, received show just a wonderful level of engagement. And, and we had, you know, now folks are starting to kind of uh, leave, but I think it was a really uh, a good and well attended session. And it was wonderful to have, really appreciate you taking time out of your very busy schedule. And, uh, and thank you again. And uh, sort of on behalf thank of everyone, you. I'll give you a quick thank round you. of applause. Much appreciated. And I really thank, enjoyed it. Thank you again, Tino. To be all right. And, and uh, see you all uh, next time. Thank Great. you again. Sounds terrific. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye.